So, Tracy, I might be disappointing, but the Canaries didn't make it into this one. <laughs> Smart. I've got better stories. It's okay. <laughs> so, um, Romeo and Juliet is not the oldest love story. Not Tristan and Isolde, not any of the Greek myths. The oldest love story is between humans and dogs. And I'm here today to tell you a part of it. Now, I'm going to warn you, this telling is going to be biased, as you heard. Um, it's my job to lobby for dogs. Uh, in my work as an evolutionary anthropologist, I study how physiology, biology, and environment um, make up human and animal communication. Now, I had a soulmate called Remy. Uh, he was perceptive and expressive, a true partner. And in his last days, I often found myself holding my breath, hoping that perhaps I could stop time and keep death from coming for him. But how did we get to that relationship? <laughs> for centuries, philosophers and scientists alike have posited that humans' capacity for complex language is a crucial marker of our species' uniqueness. Before Remy, I was familiar with this hypothesis. That's part of what I do. <laughs> um, and I probably even believed it. And yet he talked to me every day. When he was on alert, his tail curled into a question mark. When he wanted to divert my attention from you know, the ever-present screen, he would use his nose to unplug the computer cord. <laughs> it's true. And when he just you know, wanted to connect, he would turn those heart-melting eyes to mine and stare into them. His communication was deliberate and clear. Remy's uncanny cognizance prompted me to want to learn more about his mind. There was no question of his sentience, but what of his umwelt, his unique experience of the world that was so different from mine, yet so obviously intertwined? As it turns out, <laughs> more expressions, as it turns out, Remy's and now my dog Saunders, puppy dog eyes, you know that sad face, could be telling us more than when just to give them scratches or give them a treat. Um, I find that in studying human and animal behavior, our canine best friends actually have some of the best insights to offer into how our early language evolved. And in fact, their nonverbal cues, including even their facial markings, could give us clues into those early developing communication skills. Now, Remy had been my companion for nine years, too short, um, but he was there, engaged, loyal, attentive. And in many ways, our very personal and unique bond was a manifestation of this bond that had been growing between humans and canines for thousands of years. You see, long before uh, we asked them to fetch tennis balls or shake for treats. Dogs were living alongside our human ancestors and watching them very closely. In the early days of our budding romance, um, it was challenging. The relationship was fragile. It was shaped by our shared and distinct needs. And by the harsh climate of the last ice age, most of the planet was covered in glaciers, and our ancestors lived in tribes of hunter-gatherers. Life was tough for us when would-be dogs first came on the scene. Imagine you're hungry. You know, we all get hungry. There's no Uber Eats. There's no snack table back there. No DoorDash. No 7-Eleven or Starbucks. And even for the skilled hunters that our ancestors were, feeding themselves was no easy feat. Here's where it gets kind of cool. Eventually, some intrepid dogs started hanging out around our camps. Then they started following us as we hunted. Then we let them. They somehow joined us on the hunt. 
and that made things a whole lot easier. We were smitten. We were dating. We let them into our homes. We shared our food with them, these top predators, these ferocious animals. And with a top predator by our side, we felt safer. Our camps were more secure. We could settle down. Now, we don't know exactly what made would-be dogs and humans, you know, swipe right on each other and give cohabitation a go. But what we do know is that by as early as 33,000 years ago, humans were giving dogs ritual burials. They were proud or grateful or perhaps grief-stricken, I'm familiar. This dog here, or not even a dog quite yet, this is somewhere between an ancient canid and a dog as we know it today, was sent into the afterlife with a mammoth bone tucked very deliberately into his mouth. Eventually, because of dogs, we began domesticating other animals and plants. We formed agrarian societies. We tamed horses and camels and other animals that helped us speed up transport and trade between tribes. And before we knew it, we had a burgeoning global economy. And dogs were still there. And yet, their adaptive communication helped shift the relationship dynamics. Fast forward 12,000 years, and now my dog, Sonder, takes up more room in the bed <laughs> than I do. <laughs> so the more recent chapters in our shared love story show dog breeding has created an incredible diversity of animals from you know, shape, size, behavior, from chihuahuas to Great Danes. And looking at these images and thinking about these dogs, it's really easy to see how we have created them. But what we often fail to recognize is how much of a role dogs have played in making people, people. Today, by chance, those bonds that we formed thousands of years ago are now encoded in our very DNA. And dogs are fulfilling more and more critical roles throughout greater context in society. They are service dogs for differently abled. They are disease detectors. They were sniffing out COVID and cancer. They participate in ecological restoration efforts. They do search and rescue. The list goes on and on. In essence, just as dogs are dogs because of us, we are able to be human because of them. Now, today I study the underlying mechanisms of what makes dogs tick, what makes them behave. I look at their brain activity, I study their behavior. I look at the way genetics and the environment influence the people who they become and how they age. And the reason I do that is because the more we understand them, the more we can understand, our, understand ourselves and our history and the better people we can become. That is a constantly evolving process, another evolving process. I made plenty of mistakes with, in my relationship with Remy that prompted me to do things differently with Sonder. But the key thing to remember, and the science is telling us this too, dogs are individuals. They are people who need to be listened to. So 30,000 odd years is quite the commitment, one that seems especially hard to fathom in today's world with all things beeping and chiming at us. And yet, humans seem willing to continue to honor that relationship, as do dogs. Of course, maybe, maybe they're forced to, but I don't know. My, my pup likes me pretty well, I think. <laughs> and the thing is, we need to recognize that the way we interact with dogs is not irrelevant from the way we interact with each other and the way we treat each other. So in your communication with the next person you meet, be it human or canine, here's the moral of our love story. Be kind, be gentle, be ready to listen. And if you do, 
you just might get to hear another chapter of the longest story. Thank you.